All right, so the Garcia effect is named after John Garcia, who first discovered it in the early 1950s. I was really lucky when I was in graduate school, he came to give a talk at my university and he asked to meet with all the graduate students to, um, we, I was really surprised why he wanted to talk directly to the graduate students, which is one of the reasons why I went to do his talk. Cause I thought, well, what does he have to say to us that he doesn't want to say in, so, in front of the faculty. Um, but one of the things he told us was that he was trying to encourage us to, to stick with our research and to stick with our, um, you know, if we know that what we've done is correct, you know, stick with it. Don't be, um, you know, sort of bullied out of submitting research and stuff like that, because um, his findings were criticized. He could he said it took seven years to get the Garcia effect data published. And he got nothing but pushback from journals telling him that he must have falsified the data because there's no way that they were organized the way that he said that they were. And um, now he finally got it published. A bunch of people have replicated and, and things over the past, you know, at the time we were talking to him at that time, it was about 40 years um, to the point where now it was such a confirmed finding that now it's called the Garcia effect. And so the, he was really trying to encourage us that sometimes you have to push. Um, if you know what you've done is right, you, sometimes you have to push. And so I really appreciated that he wanted to talk to us about that um, because you know, graduate school is pretty hard, I'll just tell you right now. And so it was very nice to have his encouragement. So what is this effect that was so controversial? Well, he discovered that the, um, the neutral stimulus can precede the unconditioned stimulus by much longer durations of time than, um, you know, Pavlov and some of his, you know, close contemporaries asserted. They were saying that the, that the neutral stimulus must precede the unconditioned, unconditioned stimulus by like seconds or else the learner won't make the association. So I'm going to give you this example that I started to accidentally show you, which is, okay, let's imagine that you're at the fair and you eat some cotton candy and then you go on a really spinny ride. I'm calling the spinny ride um, unconditioned stimulus because sometimes it makes you sick, right? Um, to go on a spinny ride. But here's where the Garcia effect comes in. If you go, if you eat something and then something that naturally makes you sick occurs, and then within like the next 48 hours, you actually get sick, your brain will kind of file through the last things that you ate and tend to blame it on the last thing that you ate rather than the thing that actually made you sick. So for example, if you're at the, at the, um, fair and you eat cotton candy, you go on a spinny ride and you throw up. If you're at that, it's that close together and everything's all, you know, happening right in sequence, you're going to say, oh my gosh, that spinny ride made me throw up. But if let's say you eat at, sorry, my dog's barking. I think my husband's home. Um, if you eat at McDonald's and then two days later, up to two days later, you're throwing up and nobody else in the house is sick, and the only thing that you've eaten that nobody else has eaten was the McDonald's, you're probably going to blame it on the McDonald's. You're going to say, I figured it out. It's probably the McDonald's. The McDonald's would be the neutral stimulus. It's food that you have eaten in the past. The getting sick, um, whatever the mechanism is for getting you sick, either it's a foodborne, um, the unconditioned stimulus could be something foodborne, or it could be that you were getting, you know, the flu anyway, and that's why you're throwing up. Or or you're pregnant, or you know, like there's other reasons why you might be throwing up. But as you are in the process of throwing up, you'll be filing back, trying to figure out what did I eat that nobody else ate that I can blame this on. You're welcome that I got that um, pumpkin picture instead of actual vomiting, aren't you? What happens is that the neutral stimulus becomes the conditioned stimulus and illness to that conditioned stimulus is what we would call a taste aversion. You know, it fosters what we call a taste aversion. So once you've thrown up after having eaten that food, you're really likely to say, I never want to eat that food again. So I used the example of cotton candy because I actually had a student who has a taste aversion to cotton candy. And there could there be anything less likely to give you foodborne illness than cotton candy? It's just spun sugar. It's got like literally nothing that can go bad in it. But because the person ate cotton candy and then got sick within the next day was like, Cotton candy made me sick. I never want cotton candy again. 
it's a great example of how ridiculous our taste aversion sometimes can be. We will blame things that can't possibly be the reason why we're sick. Sometimes though, it is possible that that thing's what made us sick. Um, you know, maybe you ate, uh, one time my husband ate a different pizza than the rest of us. He, he ordered his type and the kids and I ate something else. And the next day when he was throwing up, he's like, what did I eat? And we came to the conclusion that the only thing he had that was different from the rest of us was this pizza. And uh, man, he had a taste aversion for years for, for pizza in general to start with. Then it was pizza just at that pizza parlor, that type of, you know, that brand. And then he ultimately was able to eat all pizzas except for he didn't want the sausage. He didn't want the Italian sausage on it. He thought that's what made him sick. Ultimately, now he's completely over it. But it took years to go from, I think it's that pizza's fault to I'm willing to eat exactly that pizza again. It took years. And so this Garcia effect, I think a lot of us can re relate to it. If you've ever eaten something and then, you know, naturally got sick for some reason, right? Could be um, chemotherapy types of treatments or um, some kind of viral, you know, norovirus or something like that. Um, a lot of times the last thing you ate beforehand gets blamed for the, for the fact that you're sick and you don't wanna eat that food again Ideally ever, your brain thinks initially, hey, I'm never eating that again, um, but maybe just for a period of time. Um, the Garcia effect has provided a way to um, reduce wolf predation on sheep. They've used um, this principle to try and convince wolves not to eat as many sheep. They still, um, oftentimes the problem with wolves is sometimes they kill them and they weren't planning on eating them anyway. So sometimes they still kill the sheep. But um, what they do is they take a sheep carcass and they put lithium chloride, which is a chemical that'll make you throw up. It doesn't really hurt you, but it makes you throw up. And they put it in the carcass. So when the um, wolf eats from a sheep carcass, they get sick. They will make this association between the sheep carcass making them sick and they'll avoid sheep for a while. It's not permanent. And I mean, it's so easy to go shopping at the sheep store compared to actually trying to go catch something out in the wild that oftentimes they'll go back and they'll try again. And like I said, sometimes they kill the sheep for reasons other than eating. Um, and so it's not perfect, but it helps to reduce some of the predation that's, you know, at least hunger based or food based. Uh, so that's the Garcia effect. And so you can imagine um, that this principle drives a lot of, um, you know, our food preferences for sure. You know, like our individual idiosyncratic, you know, personality kind of like um, things that we like or don't like. It might have something to do with experiences that we've had that are very much like the Garcia effect. All right. So now when we specifically attempt to apply classical conditioning to personality, we can say that, you know, classical conditioning can be used to explain the emotional aspects of personality, like neurotic behavior, things that we are anxious about, things that we, you know, if you tend to have, you know, worry, it might be traced back to classically conditioned associations that you have. Um, really early research in psychology, you guys might remember a study with John Watson and a, a little toddler named Little Albert, um, where John Watson induced a phobia in Little Albert. Um, he found out, Watson found out later that you really can't induce phobias in older people like college students. Like it doesn't really work. Apparently, you know, if you already understand how the world works, the phobia would be really hard to induce. But in a toddler, an association can be made between something scary and something neutral. And so that the neutral thing becomes fear, fear inducing. And uh, it'll stick with you probably for your whole life. And you don't know why. That's the, that's the, um, kind of scary thing about classical conditioning is that it can cause these sort of unconscious responses that are happening, you know, outside of your awareness, you're just having this response. And then superstitious behavior, like feeling like you have to knock on wood if you, um, if you say something that might invite, you know, disaster or something, you have to knock on wood to get rid of it. These kinds of superstitious behaviors uh, might be a function of associations between things that happened in the past and, and our brain is telling us, you know, oh, well, you better do something to, to negate the power of having, you know, associated two things, you know, I, maybe you, you're inviting disaster. So superstitious behavior can, can oftentimes be traced back to classically conditioned um, associations. So, you know, 
maybe not the healthiest parts of our personality oftentimes might be attributable to classical conditioning. Now, I just mentioned John Watson, and he was really, you know, in the field of psychology in particular, not, you know, an accidental physiologist or whatever. Um, he really was the founder of what we call behaviorism in psychology. He said, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I guarantee to take any one at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. Regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. He said this in 1930. Watson really believed in the power of the environment to shape us into whatever kind of person that the environment demands. So he wasn't just trying to be super hyper um, powerful himself. He just thought the environment is that powerful. So he's, a, he's credited with founding the School of Behaviorism in the 1920s. Um, he applied these classical conditioning principles that Pavlov introduced on animals. He applied them to humans. He took what we call a tabula rasa ap approach, which is where you sort of assume that a person is born a blank slate. So I just said tabula rasa approach. It woke up my phone and caused Google to search for it. No, your phone's not listening to you all the time, is it? Um, that's not annoying or creepy at all. Uh, so <laughs> tabula rasa. So the assumption that Watson carries with him is that you were born with absolutely no aspects of your personality intact. That every single thing about you is a reaction to the environment in which you've been raised. So think about that a little bit and think to yourself, do I agree with that or do I not agree with that? Was I born a completely blank slate and it was completely, it was strictly a result of the environment writing on me that determined how I am? Or did I come with some predispositions and some factors that were inherently part of me? I mean, we just finished the, bi the chapter on biology before the exam and you might be thinking, Man, this is completely opposite of what we were just saying. So this is really important time to wrap up and remind that um, personal, this class is going to have a lot of these circumstances where one theory says something exactly and completely the opposite of another theory. And, you know, there's really not a lot of like closure on which one is right or better supported by data. Um, so it's kind of complicated. So he founded this school of thought called behaviorism. And one of the things that he argued is that um, as scientists, psychologists should not attempt to study anything that they can't directly observe. So we shouldn't attempt to study things like the mind. We shouldn't ask the participants what they think about anything or ask them to describe their typical behaviors or anything like that, because we can't directly see it. We should only study those things that we can directly observe. So that's going to be really limiting, especially if your interest is something like personality, right? Because typically personality is something... We can see the effects of your personality, maybe through your behavior or your speech patterns or what you write down or something like that, but we can't directly see your personality and we can't see you in every context. So we may only see a window of your personality if we ob observe you directly, you know, in our lab or something, but in every other circumstance, you might behave differently. Um, so it's quite the challenge to try and study a topic like personality through the lens of behaviorism. But we're going to try. And I think I did an okay job of tying classical conditioning together with personality. Um, let's go ahead and take a little break here. Oh, I see I have an animation. And we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about how behavioristic principles might work on us humans. <laughs> 